It was a dream that lured hundreds to risk their lives. It powered the conquest of South America, a city covered in gold, richer than anyone had ever imagined. Yet for centuries, most people have assumed that El Dorado was only a myth. Now, a recent discovery is giving explorers new hope. Could there really be a city of gold just waiting to be discovered? My quest to find out will take me from the high peaks of the Andes to the icy waters of Lake Titicaca, to the mysterious pyramids of Paratuari, deep in the Amazon jungle. We're digging for the truth, and we're going to extremes to do it. Five hundred years ago, in the high Andes mountains, a story began to circulate of a place with more gold than anyone had ever heard of. Spanish conquistadors called it El Dorado and searched for it for centuries. To them, it wasn't a myth. They believed it was real because of the astonishing amounts of gold they really did find in South America. Hi, I'm Josh Bernstein. Nowhere was there more gold than here in Cusco, Peru, the capital of the Inca Empire. During the 15th century, the Incas built the largest, richest empire in pre-colonial America. It stretched for some 3,000 miles, from what's now Ecuador to Chile. The emperor of this vast kingdom was worshipped as a descendant of the sun, the god of the Incas. He was surrounded in luxury, and every day he was dressed in golden ornaments. To the Spaniards, who heard tales of his riches, his gold was their dream come true. When the Spanish first came to Cusco, they found temples coated with gold. Effigies, ornaments, jewelry, clothing, everything was gold. The Inca seemed to have an inexhaustible supply of it. but the gold was never enough for the conquistadors. Rumors of a golden city hidden in the jungle became an obsession. Even today, it lures treasure seekers to risk their lives in search of it. Why does the legend of El Dorado have so much power? Could there be any truth to it? There's no better place to find answers to these questions than here in Cusco. In this city today, signs of the Spanish conquest are everywhere. But Cusco is built on Inca foundations, and you don't have to look very hard to find them. They say that Inca were the greatest stonemasons of the ancient world, and it's easy to see why when you see how perfectly they cut and join these massive stones together. But has the gold survived as well as the Inca walls? Peter? To find out, I'm meeting Peter Frost, an historian who's lived in Cusco for 30 years. Peter takes me to the Spanish cathedral, built with the riches of the conquest. I've never seen so much gold. The altar is covered with it. So this is where a lot of the gold ended up. A lot of it did, yes. You had a huge accumulation of Inca gold, 20% of it went to the king in Spain. As his, that was his tax, that was his cut of the loot of the conquest. Then you had individual conquistadors taking their share, and many of them donated large amounts of their share to the church because they, they were very pious Catholics, and much of it ended up in these imposing gold leaf altars in the Spanish churches that was fabulously impressive to anybody who, who saw them at the time. And a, a good deal of the, the point of that was to impress the natives with the power of Spanish religion. It was an astute move on the part of the Spaniards. They knew that gold was sacred to the Incas, who used it to create beautiful objects in honor of their god, the sun. But gold had a very different meaning for the conquistadors. Most of these beautiful objects were melted down by the Spanish. To the Spanish, it was bullion. It was turned into coins and ingots. 
thousands of the Incas who were alive at this time had to watch their sacred relics being melted down for the Spanish. Indeed they did. They, had, they saw their, their meaning, their cosmology, their religious symbols being stripped away and disappearing, melting, melted down. And, uh, it was a major trauma for them, part of the trauma of the conquest. As Peter leads me around the church, I continue to be amazed by the amount of gold that's here. Yet it's only a fraction of what the Inca ruler possessed. He was the sole owner of the empire's gold, so he received regular tributes from conquered lands. Well, in today's money, it was mega millions of dollars. Uh, it was a staggering fortune in those times. A staggering fortune that was taken by people who were poor. I mean, they were nobodies, these conquistadors, in their own country at the time. And suddenly, overnight, they were wealthy beyond their wildest dreams. It was an extraordinary story. But how does this fit into the legend of El Dorado? Well, the way I see it, El Dorado was the dream of the have-nots, because the first wave of conquistadors made fabulous fortunes. These stories came back to Spain and to Central America, where the Spanish had already been for a while, and, and the people started flooding down here. It was like a gold rush, in a way. But where was the gold? You know, now it was, most of it was in, in the hands of conquistadors who had already taken their, the, the major share. You know, so the next guys had to have a dream to live on for. What Peter's saying is that the legend of El Dorado persisted because the conquistadors desperately wanted to believe in it. Likewise, the Inca version of the story continued to evolve long after the Spanish invasion of 1532. The legend goes that the Incas saved some of their treasures and retreated to this mythical city somewhere in the rainforest. All these myths have, have survived, and there may be some truth in those legends. There are so many layers to the legend of El Dorado, it's no wonder it's taken on a life of its own. And now I've just heard that there's something more, a recent discovery that's giving explorers new hope that El Dorado is more than a myth. Luckily, I've been able to catch up with a seasoned explorer named Greg Diarmengia. Greg works as a psychologist in Boston, but for the past 20 years, he's spent much of his free time in the jungles of Peru, on the trail of El Dorado. So what is it that's gotten everyone so excited about El Dorado again? This has. What is that? This is a copy of a letter recently discovered in the Vatican archives written by a Jesuit priest in the mid-1500s. And what does it say about El Dorado? It describes a journey of Indians of that era to the kingdom of Paititi. And what is Paititi? Paititi is said to be the Incan city of gold beyond Cusco. So the Incas also believed in a city of gold beyond Cusco. Could this be the same place the Spaniards called El Dorado? The Incas believed that they were descendants of a great hero called Incare. He rose from the waters of Lake Titicaca to found Cusco and then ended his days in Paititi, deep in the jungle. When the Spaniards heard this story, they began to search for Paititi, believing it must be the real El Dorado. They never found it. Now, Greg says this letter gives credence to the idea that Paititi was a real place. And the letter describes it as rich in gold. Maybe El Dorado really did exist. So if we were to follow the instructions, where is Paititi? We can follow the direction to the northeast, um, and we can get a lot of clues from this document that we didn't previously have. Northeast of Cusco. Northeast of Cusco, yes. Where would that put it on the map? It would put it an indefinite distance in this direction, but it would take us through the Pantiacolla area, the area most frequently associated with Baititi in local Peruvian legend. Much of the Pantiacolla is dense jungle, largely unexplored. In the south of it is a series of strange formations called the Pyramids of Paratuari. Greg was the first to explore them in 1996. At the time, he wasn't able to fully determine whether they're natural or man-made. So he says they're definitely worth more study. But he cautions that they're very hard to reach. It's a torturous kind of terrain in that it's so covered with dense vegetation, moss, ravines, 
um, dense cloud forest, high altitude jungle, lower altitude jungle, unnavigable rivers, such that traveling there is one difficulty after another. But if I wanted to go on a search and take an expedition out there, could you help me organize that? Absolutely. Yeah? Yeah. Pretty good adventure, huh? Greg's gotten me excited about the possibility of finding Paititi, but he has a lot of preparations to make first. Our journey will cover a broad range of territory, from mountains to rivers to thick jungles few have penetrated. Sounds like a real adventure. Meanwhile, I'm heading off on a mini expedition of my own. I know why the Spaniards wanted gold, but I want to know more about what it meant to the Incas. Coming up, Lake Titicaca. At an altitude where most people are skydiving, I scuba dive the icy waters of one of the world's highest lakes in search of clues to the true story of El Dorado. I'm on a quest to find El Dorado, the legendary city of gold. I've learned that here in Peru, it's called Paititi, and that it may be more than just a legend. In Cusco, I saw a 16th century letter that suggests the city is a real place. Before I go in search of it, I'm headed for Lake Titicaca, the sacred lake of the Incas. It's long been associated with legends of gold. Wow, this is Lake Titicaca. It's breathtaking, literally, at close to 13,000 feet above sea level. I can barely breathe. It's gonna take my body a few days to acclimatize. Yet I'm anxious to get into the water. I've heard that the Incas actually sacrificed golden treasures to this lake 500 years ago. Why would they sacrifice something so valuable? I'm wondering if there's any evidence left to be found at the bottom of the lake. There's only one way to find out. Okay. That's where we're going to dive. Diving at this altitude is a real challenge. Almost nobody dives in Titicaca. But my guide, Gustavo Villavicencio, has a real passion for underwater archaeology, despite the dangers. High altitude diving has a whole different set of risks associated oh, yeah. with it. At 13,000 feet, the atmospheric pressure is less than half of what it is at sea level. That makes scuba much more dangerous. So for us to be safe, we're being conservative with our, di with our bottom time. Yeah, we're very conservative. We're so we'll spend a little less time than the dive table shows because of the altitude. Because of the altitude, yeah. And yeah. we also have to consider that the water is very cold here. we got 90 degrees Celsius here. So. Cold water. Yeah, it's cold water. Yeah. Okay. See, I've I've dived in like the Caribbean and yeah. Pacific where it's warm. Sounds great. This is my first cold wa cold water high altitude dive. Uh, that's your first very cold water. <laughs> really? <Okay. laughs> very cold water. Looking forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. In 2004, an expedition with a remote submersible sighted a gold icon in this lake that weighed an estimated 77 pounds. So there's probably a lot more to be found, but diving here is going to be very tricky. I'm uh, a little apprehensive. I've never done high altitude diving. I've never done super cold water winter diving. And I see that Gustavo's wearing a dry suit. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not. So he may know something I don't. But you're tough. I'm tough? You're tougher than I am. Yeah. Well, we'll see how it goes. But yeah, I'm a little <laughs> nervous. This is uh, the whole altitude thing. I'm not sure how that's going to go. 13,000 feet, and we're going scuba diving. We'll see. Ah, that is cold! You aren't kidding! The first shock feels like diving into a bucket of ice. And at 48 degrees Fahrenheit, this isn't that far from the truth. But I force myself to adjust, moving and breathing very slowly. I start looking for the glint of gold. Over the centuries, anything old would have settled deep into the bottom. Every rock or tuft of grass could hide something precious. But I'm not going to find it without lots of effort. The seconds tick by. We can only stay down for 25 minutes. Now I understand why most expeditions take weeks to find anything here. There must be an easier way to determine why the Incas sacrificed gold to this lake. We don't want to outstay our welcome. Gold would have been nice, but this has been a beautiful dive. Definitely, definitely an adventure worth doing. 
The next day, we head out again. Knowing my interest in the lake's history, Gustavo takes me to a sacred island. He points out sanctuaries built from rocks and says that worshippers would gather here as the sun rose over the lake to honor the sun god. So who made this? Uh, this is pre-Incas, Tiahuanaco possibly. So they're old. Yeah, old. They've been they're here for a long time. Yeah, they've been here for a thousand years. And if we were here a thousand years ago, right here looking at this sanctuary, what would be going on? What would we see? Uh, we can see a bunch of uh, people pray and throw uh, pottery and uh, sometimes gold, uh, uh, carve of uh, stone carved boxes, and they put uh, these gold idols inside and just throw them to the lake. They would actually throw gold into these waters? That's right. Wow. So even long before the Incas, ancient Peruvians were sacrificing gold into this lake. Gold was a symbol of their god, the sun. No wonder its value to them was spiritual, not monetary. I also find out that Lake Titicaca is even more important to my quest than I realized, because it's here, in the sacred high lakes of the Andes, that the legend of El Dorado actually began. Native people told stories of a great king who rode a golden raft into the lake. The king was so rich that he was covered in gold dust from head to toe. He would bathe in the lake and make golden offerings to the gods. The Spaniards called the king El Dorado, which means the golden one. As the legend spread and caught fire, the golden king became a golden city. But it's this story that inspired one of the world's most enduring obsessions. Gold ornaments, gold Next, I'll find out how the Spaniards stole the Inca's treasure, and then strike out for the dense jungle on the hunt for the lost city of gold. I'm on the trail of El Dorado, the legendary city of gold the Incas called Paititi. In Cusco, Greg Diarmangian showed me a 400-year-old letter that describes it as a real place, 10 days' journey from Cusco. At Lake Titicaca, I discovered the origins of the myth and why the Indians would sacrifice their gold to the lake. Stories of the Incas' incredible wealth reached the Spanish conquistadors, who journeyed to Peru. What they found was even more amazing than their wildest dreams. What's the Coricancha? Well, I'm meeting Peter lake, Frost again in Cusco. He says I'll understand more when I see what's left of the Cori Concha, the main Inca temple dedicated to worshiping the sun. This wall was the outer wall of the Temple of the Sun, and it's a marvel of architecture. It's extraordinary fitting of the stone and the curve. Peter tells me that the Spaniards often built their churches on top of native temples. It was part of their effort to convert the Incas. In this case, even more of the Inca temple was preserved inside the church. Peter, what would this place have looked like during Incan times? Well, it would have been dazzling, awe-inspiring, covered in gold. Everywhere you looked, there would have been sheets of gold on the walls. There were certainly golden ornaments and gold decoration, gold wall cladding. So this whole wall would have been covered in gold? Very probably, yes. And there'd be like gold effigies mm -hmm. here? Yeah. It would have been shining, full of light, really impressive. It was gold's ability to catch the rays of the sun that led the Incas to consider it sacred. They learned to shape the metal into beautiful patterns, but they never considered its monetary value until the arrival of the Spaniards in 1532. The conquistadors were led by an illiterate hustler in Francisco Pizarro. He was obsessed by the dream of El Dorado. Unscrupulous and crafty, he lured the Inca emperor into meeting with him, unarmed. It was a fatal mistake. So what happened to all the gold? Well, when the Spanish conquistador Francisco Pizarro entered the Inca emperor, he captured the Inca emperor and the Inca emperor offered to fill a room full of gold and two rooms full of silver in exchange for his freedom. So Pizarro captures the Incan king and holds him for ransom. That's right. 
Pizarro doubted the ransom could be fulfilled. But he gave Atahualpa two months for the gold to reach the line on the wall of his cell. He sent some of his own men to help collect the loot. Pizarro sends four men down to Cusco, where they know there's a huge stash of gold here. They come into the Coricancha, and this is what they see. And with their own bare hands, they strip this extraordinary treasure and send it back to be melted down. So these four Spanish soldiers, they come in here, and they're seeing this place is just covered with gold. I'm trying to imagine it. It's just gold everywhere. There was right? a garden of gold that, yeah. here with, with, with flowers and ears of corn. Um, potatoes, you know, they made of gold and silver, animals too, uh, and they just scooped the whole lot up and, and took, it, took it off. For weeks, the gold arrived in Atahualpa's cell from all corners of the Inca Empire. But as the pile grew, Pizarro became apprehensive at the thought of letting his captive free. He decided to go back on his word and killed Atahualpa before the ransom was complete. The Spaniards destroyed the cultural treasures of the Incas. They melted the gold into ingots and divided the spoils. But legend has it that some treasure never reached the Spaniards before Atahualpa was killed. It's said that the Incas themselves took it away into the jungle, to the city called Paititi. No wonder the conquistadors kept looking for it. This gives me even more reason to head off into the jungle myself. And I've got a great team. Greg Diarmangian and his partner Polino Mamani worked together on their first expedition to the pyramids of Paratuari. The letter Greg showed me places Paititi 10 days travel from Cusco. Drawing on his knowledge of Inca lore, Greg believes that if the city exists, it's most likely northeast of Cusco, beyond the town of Choqui Cancha. It's a wild, unexplored region, which includes the mysterious pyramids of Paratuari. The Incas in the letter would have traveled by foot to Paititi. 400 years later, it's impossible to duplicate their journey. But Greg says we're probably pretty close. So we're going through the Sacred Valley and Chukicancha, which means gold enclosure, uh, is a far outpost of the Incan Empire. It would have been there that people would have gone towards the eastern edges, the northern and eastern edges of the Incan Empire. So if we were here during Incan times, we're now, we'd be passing through the periphery into the uncharted territories. Yes, exactly. And this valley that we're in now, would they have traveled through this? Sure, this is well traveled in Incan times. Really? The Sacred Valley. This valley is called sacred because it's where the Inca royalty lived. And I don't blame them. The scenery is spectacular. The hillsides are still terraced for farming, the way the Incas laid them out. In fact, the landscape seems to have changed very little since the Spanish conquest. Inca descendants still farm and herd goats and llamas, just like their ancestors did 600 years ago. We pass several Inca ruins. There's 30 walls still impressive. I can't help but wonder about the great civilization that once flourished here and what it might have accomplished if the Spaniards had never dreamed of El Dorado. It's 100 miles to Choque Cancha, where we'll leave the van behind. This road is so full of switchbacks, it'll take us three and a half hours to get there. But I just as soon we take our time on roads like this. You know, one thing I'm wondering about in terms of El Dorado and Paititi is where would all the gold come from? Were there gold in the hills out here? Yeah, but they had such a large quantity of gold it had to come from elsewhere, and many of the jungle areas provided gold to the Incas. And is it uh, alluvial gold on the surface, or do you have to actually mine for it? Both kinds, but, but most of it would be on the surface. Really? So yeah. we might see some? We might. That'd be exciting. Yeah. If we find some, can we keep it? <laughs> <laughs> After a few hours, it begins to feel as if we're getting to the edge of civilization. 
In Inca times, this far eastern part of the empire was called the Antisuyo. It was wild and uncharted, just as it is today. We pull into Choque Concha in the late afternoon. Looks like they're ready for us. I'm drawn to the stone walls along the edge of the square. You don't get this kind of fine architecture in these remote, remote areas unless it's uh, indicating something very important. Greg tells me and, these um, walls the mark the northeastern yeah. boundary of the Incan Empire. Would have stood in the niches beyond them lay the frontier Paititi. and the fabled city of Paititi. So beyond this, it's just a llama ride into the jungle. Right? <laughs> we'll take the llamas, yeah. far, but the llamas won't go in the jungle themselves. They won't. But we will. Will we ride them? No, we just, they just walk with us. <laughs> I'm new to llama riding. They're <laughs> llama trekking. So I guess we just, they carry some of this stuff. Why actually, why don't we go over there and show me how it works, okay? okay. Are llamas friendly creatures? No, uh, they're kind of skittish. They're kind of skittish, yeah. yeah. You have to get to know them. We got a wild one. Llamas have been the pack animals of the Andes for millennia. But I find out that they're not very strong. They can only carry about 80 pounds, and even that not for long. So when one gets tired, you move the pack to another. Jumping llamas. Okay, so it's a little bit uh, fidgety. The llamas are ready, and so are we. The scenery is fantastic up on these high ridges. I'm used to the Rockies, but the Andes are a whole new experience in mountain trekking. Being followed by a bunch of llamas. Uh-oh. Oh, they're gaining on us. They're gaining on me. My body is finally getting used to the high altitude. So Greg, how high are we now? We're about 9,500 feet. So we're below Cusco and way below Titicaca. Yeah, yeah. That's nice. It's nice to be able to breathe again. Absolutely, yeah. It's high enough, though. The trail we're following is really old, but still in pretty good shape. So, Greg, this is part of the Inca Trail, isn't it? Yeah. This is part of an Inca network of trails from Choquecancha to the north and to the east of here. So this isn't yeah. like the Inca Trail where people think of Machu Picchu, but it's an Inca Trail. Right. This is one of the many, but this is... I find out that the Incas were in some ways just like the Romans. The east. They united their empire with roads. The Incas built more than 15,000 miles of them. Messengers called Chasqui carried news and parcels from one corner of the empire to the other. A team of these runners could carry fresh fish from the Pacific to the emperor's table in Cusco, almost 300 miles in a single day. In fact, Greg tells me that the Inca roads were so good that a journey to Paititi today could actually take longer than it did 400 years ago, even with our head start in the van. We descend until we lose the last of the light. This part of the journey feels like the peaceful calm before a storm. I know that the jungle will be a lot harder. Many explorers have lost their lives in that dense, unmapped terrain. The llamas were great in the highlands, but here in the lowlands, it's way too hot, and they'd only slow us down. From here, our search for El Dorado will be in the jungles of the Amazon. To get there, we'll go by boat. Hey, Paulina. Joining our expedition is Darwin Moscoso, a local expert on these jungle rivers. Well, we have to move quick because it's a long way. Retrocedemos un poco. The boat's long-tailed outboard is specially adapted to the shallow streams further on in the jungle. What's this boat called? Is it Pecky Pecky? Pecky Pecky. It's a single cylinder. Pecky 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 Pecky, that's why. To the jungle. The distance we still have to travel is about 17 miles, as the crow flies. But in the jungle, distance can be meaningless. Making your way through here is like forging a path through an endless maze. Greg, to get towards where Paititi might be, we take this larger river 
into a smaller river, and then eventually we just have to get out and bushwhack. Yep. Right. Sounds like a plan. Darwin, have you heard of Paititi? Yeah, I was trying to find it. You were looking for it? Yeah, no, I, I was looking for 10 years. For 10 years? 10 years, yeah. Oh. Each time, it's expeditions for one, two, three, and four months. In many ways, Greg and Darwin seem just as obsessed as the conquistadors in their search for El Dorado. At first, I wonder what keeps them looking. But then I hear the story that inspires all Peruvian explorers. It was 1911, high in the Andes northwest of Cusco, about 100 miles from where we are now. Hiram Bingham, a 35-year-old professor, was searching for a lost Inca city. After weeks of fruitless trekking through dense jungle, he was led by a native boy to an overgrown ruin on a mountaintop. It turned out to be Machu Picchu. Now, what was once a lost city is celebrated as one of the finest achievements of Inca culture. It's stories like this that keep explorers heading back into Peru's jungle frontier, in many ways as uncharted now as it was 500 years ago. Yet I can't help but think of the hundreds of explorers who've lost their lives in this jungle, killed by hostile natives, wild animals, or rivers that can rise and grow turbulent in a matter of minutes. Yeah, very long. Should we pull it? You want us to get out and pull it? It isn't long before we hit trouble. So what do we do now, Darwin? It's a push time, man. Push. We got to push. You know, you say push, we say how hard. We got to push. But I think we will we'll take the, the, the canal is that way. Okay. Okay, uno, dos, tres. We've got to keep an eye out for stingrays. Greg says they're all over these waters. Piranha and poisonous snakes, too. I'm not sorry to get back into the boat. We're traveling on one of the little tributaries that branches off the Alto Madre de Dios River. We're hoping this one will take us up into the foothills of our search area. There are dozens of these tributaries, and Greg, Paulino, and Darwin have explored many of them in their prior searches for Paititi. It feels as if we're going deeper and deeper into a primeval jungle wilderness, an environment completely untouched by humans. Yet Greg has found ruins not far from here, so he's sure that this area is a prime candidate for Paititi. It's back to pushing. But now the river is little more than a stream. We've got to slash our way through. We try several tributaries. The end result is always the same. I'm beginning to understand why so few people venture into these remote headwaters. Even the Pecky Pecky doesn't stand a chance of getting through. It looks like the end of our ride. From here, we've got to leave the boat behind and strike out through the jungle on foot.
Now, we're miles from where we'd plan to start bushwhacking, in a part of the jungle Greg and the rest of the team don't really know. Getting to our search area near the pyramids of Paratuari will require every last ounce of energy. And in the jungle, every step is fraught with danger. This is an environment where everything moves, even the plants. And if it doesn't move, it'll bite, sting, Watch out for this one. or stick you. And we inch our way forward. At this rate, it could take us a week just to reach the search area if we don't miss it altogether. I always knew we were looking for a needle in a haystack. I just never realized how big this haystack was going to be. Coming up, our journey through the jungle takes a turn for the worse. I think this is nuts. I'm searching for El Dorado, the legendary city of gold known as Paititi here in Peru. A 400-year-old letter describes it as a 10-day journey from Cusco. Explorer Greg Diarmengian organized an expedition. We followed the ancient trails of the Incas over the Andes and down into the Amazon jungle. That's when our journey got challenging. After repeatedly running aground, we abandoned our boat and struck out into the jungle on foot, miles before we'd planned to. We're trying to slash our way through to the pyramids of Paratuari, to the search area we've identified as the best place to look for Paititi. Just when I think we have a chance of reaching it, the rain begins. I know it's a rainforest, but this rain is relentless. We have to move even slower now, and our optimism is wearing thin. Now, every step is treacherous. If one of us twists an ankle, or encounters a snake, we're miles from help. We're finding it hard to see even 10 feet in front of us. Greg says that the jungle around the pyramids is so dense that we could be standing on one of them and not even realize it. I think about the Incas in the letter I saw in Cusco. There's no way of knowing how they reached Paititi, or even if their story is true or not. We could search for weeks and miss something just a hundred yards away. I think this is nuts. Oh, man. I mean, there could be a city right there and we'd walk right past it. It's hot, yeah. it's raining too much. So, man, we're glad to be about this thing. It could be that in order to advance, we're gonna have to go back, get up in an airplane, get aerial view, plan things from there. So we could actually yeah, get above I think, this. I think yeah. it's really nice. All right, I, think I mean, we're not gonna get through it. So I think the only way might be to get above it. If that's an option, I'd say let's try that. The jungle has turned out to be a more formidable foe than I imagined. It's a pretty soggy and dispirited crew that finally finds its way back to the Pecky Pecky. But there's a glimmer of hope yet. Turns out the Peruvian Air Force flies these jungles to deliver mail. To whom, I can't imagine. But tribes do live in some of the most remote parts of the Amazon. We may not have been able to reach the pyramids on foot, but it looks like the Air Force is willing to give us a bird's eye view.
they agree to take the door off the plane and slow it down to let us study the terrain more closely. The crew's mood has definitely improved. Slashing through the jungle, I didn't realize how vast it is. It goes on for hundreds of miles. There's one tributary after another. I wonder how many lead to dead ends like the ones we encountered. Suddenly, I see something unusual. Huge mounds that rise up in a way that doesn't look natural. These must be the pyramids of Paratuari. But are they really pyramids? They're shaped like pyramids. Whether they're real pyramids or not has been debated. Natural or man-made remains to be seen. I'm dying to get down there and explore them. But they're so choked with jungle, I can barely make them out. Greg spent four days here and wasn't able to finish examining them. Alina and I went there in 1996 to first to reach there on foot and investigate. We explored a large part of it, found most likely natural, but there are parts of it that still need to be explored. So we may have to come back here one day. It's the only way to know for sure to be there on foot. There's no place to land. I have to face it. This is as close as I'm going to get to those mysterious pyramids, at least for now. They're great. Okay. Yes. Greg says that the pyramids are probably a natural formation, but there's still a small chance that they could be man-made, maybe even a remnant of a lost city like Paititi. In any case, just this glimpse has given me a whole new perspective on what keeps the legend of El Dorado alive. For centuries, it was greed for gold that led the conquistadors to risk their lives in Peru's jungles. But for the explorers of today, it isn't gold. It's the thrill of discovery. It's finding something that's been lost to history and restoring its wonder for all to appreciate. That's a thrill I can understand. as I search for El Dorado, the legendary city of gold. It was a dream that lured hundreds to risk their lives. It powered the conquest of South America, a city covered in gold, richer than anyone had ever imagined. Yet for centuries, most people have assumed that El Dorado was only a myth. Now, a recent discovery is giving explorers new hope. Could there really be a city of gold just waiting to be discovered. My quest to find out will take me from the high peaks of the Andes to the icy waters of Lake Titicaca, to the mysterious pyramids of Paratuari, deep in the Amazon jungle. We're digging for the truth, and we're going to extremes to do it. Five hundred years ago, in the high Andes mountains, a story began to circulate of a place with more gold than anyone had ever heard of. Spanish conquistadors called it El Dorado and searched for it for centuries. To them, it wasn't a myth. They believed it was real because of the astonishing amounts of gold they really did find in South America. Hi, I'm Josh Bernstein. Nowhere was there more gold than here in Cusco, Peru, the capital of the Inca Empire. During the 15th century, the Incas built the largest, richest empire in pre-colonial America. 
It stretched for some 3,000 miles, from what's now Ecuador to Chile. The emperor of this vast kingdom was worshipped as a descendant of the sun, the god of the Incas. He was surrounded in luxury, and every day he was dressed in golden ornaments. To the Spaniards, who heard tales of his riches, his gold was their dream come true. When the Spanish first came to Cusco, they found temples coated with gold. Effigies, ornaments, jewelry, clothing, everything was gold. The Incas seemed to have an inexhaustible supply of it. But the gold was never enough for the conquistadors. Rumors of a golden city hidden in the jungle became an obsession. Even today, it lures treasure seekers to risk their lives in search of it. Why does the legend of El Dorado have so much power? Could there be any truth to it? There's no better place to find answers to these questions than here in Cusco. In this city today, signs of the Spanish conquest are everywhere. But Cusco is built on Inca foundations, and you don't have to look very hard to find them. They say that Inca were the greatest stonemasons of the ancient world, and it's easy to see why when you see how perfectly they cut and join these massive stones together. But has the gold survived as well as the Inca walls? Peter? To find out, I'm meeting Peter Frost, an historian who's lived in Cusco for 30 years. Peter takes me to the Spanish cathedral, built with the riches of the conquest. I've never seen so much gold. The altar is covered with it. So this is where a lot of the gold ended up. A lot of it did, yes. You had a huge accumulation of Inca gold. 20% of it went to the king in Spain. As his, that was his tax. That was his cut of the loot of the conquest. Then you had individual conquistadors taking their share. And many of them donated large amounts of their share to the church because they, they were very pious Catholics. And much of it ended up in these imposing gold leaf altars in the Spanish churches that was fabulously impressive to anybody who, who saw them at the time. And a, a good deal of the, the point of that was to impress the natives with the power of Spanish religion. It was an astute move on the part of the Spaniards. They knew that gold was sacred to the Incas, who used it to create beautiful objects in honor of their god, the sun. But gold had a very different meaning for the conquistadors. Most of these beautiful objects were melted down by the Spanish. To the Spanish, it was bullion. It was turned into coins and ingots. So the Incas who were alive at this time had to watch their sacred relics being melted down for the Spanish. Indeed, they did. They, had, they saw their, their meaning, their cosmology, their religious symbols being stripped away and disappearing, melting, melted down. Uh, it was a major trauma for them, part of the trauma of the conquest. As Peter leads me around the church, I continue to be amazed by the amount of gold that's here. Yet it's only a fraction of what the Inca ruler possessed. He was the sole owner of the empire's gold, so he received regular tributes from conquered lands. Well, in today's money, it was mega millions of dollars. Uh, it was a staggering fortune in those times. A staggering fortune that was taken by people who were poor. I mean, they were nobodies, these conquistadors, in their own country at the time. And suddenly, overnight, they were wealthy beyond their wildest dreams. It was an extraordinary story. But how does this fit into the legend of El Dorado? Well, the way I see it, El Dorado was the dream of the have-nots, because the first wave of conquistadors made fabulous fortunes. These stories came back to Spain and to Central America, where the Spanish had already been for a while, and, and the people started flooding down here. It was like a gold rush, in a way. But where was the gold? You know, now it was, most of it was in, in the hands of conquistadors who had already taken their, the, the major share. You know, so the next guys had to have a dream to live on for. 
What Peter's saying is that the legend of El Dorado persisted because the conquistadors desperately wanted to believe in it. Likewise, the Inca version of the story continued to evolve long after the Spanish invasion of 1532. The legend goes that the Incas saved some of their treasures and retreated to this mythical city somewhere in the rainforest. All these myths have, have survived, and there may be some truth in those legends. There are so many layers to the legend of El Dorado, it's no wonder it's taken on a life of its own. And now I've just heard that there's something more, a recent discovery that's giving explorers new hope that El Dorado is more than a myth. Luckily, I've been able to catch up with a seasoned explorer named Greg Diarmengian. Greg works as a psychologist in Boston, but for the past 20 years, he spent much of his free time in the jungles of Peru, on the trail of El Dorado. So what is it that's gotten everyone so excited about El Dorado again? This has. What is that? This is a copy of a letter recently discovered in the Vatican archives, written by a Jesuit priest in the mid-1500s. And what does it say about El Dorado? It describes a journey of Indians of that era to the kingdom of Paititi. And what is Paititi? Paititi is said to be the Incan city of gold beyond Cusco. So the Incas also believed in a city of gold beyond Cusco. Could this be the same place the Spaniards called El Dorado? The Incas believed that they were descendants of a great hero called Incare. He rose from the waters of Lake Titicaca to found Cusco and then ended his days in Paititi, deep in the jungle. When the Spaniards heard this story, they began to search for Paititi, believing it must be the real El Dorado. They never found it. Now, Greg says this letter gives credence to the idea that Paititi was a real place. And the letter describes it as rich in gold. Maybe El Dorado really did exist. So if we were to follow the instructions, where is Paititi? We can follow the direction to the northeast, um, and we can get a lot of clues from this document that we didn't previously have. Northeast of Cusco? Northeast of Cusco, yes. Where would that put it on the map? It would put it an indefinite distance in this direction but it would take us through the Pantiacolla area, the area most frequently associated with Baititi in local Peruvian legend. Much of the Pantiacolla is dense jungle, largely unexplored. In the south of it is a series of strange formations called the Pyramids of Paratuari. Greg was the first to explore them in 1996. At the time, he wasn't able to fully determine whether they're natural or man-made. So he says they're definitely worth more study. We go but he cautions.